you think about the, the, the word marriage or the subject of marriage, it, it, it brings a, a lot of different ideas and a lot of different thoughts to a lot of different people's minds. Uh, some people uh, don't even like the word. Uh, some people like to avoid the word. Uh, for some people, it's something they're looking forward to. For some people, it's something they're enjoying. Uh, but we do know that God's Word tells us that uh, marriage is a gift from God, and it is designed by God to be a wonderful blessing to those that uh, do not have the gift of celibacy, as some people do. Uh, but it certainly is a gift that has been misunderstood by many. It's been maligned by people. It's been under attack since the Garden of Eden. Anything that's created and designed by God to be good and to bring glory to God is something that we can know is going to be attacked by uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it certainly is, cer uh, certainly is still under attack today. Um, and so uh, I want for my children, I want them to have a Christ-centered marriage. I want them to have a Christ-centered home. Uh, I don't want them to just have any in ma any marriage. I don't want them to endure marriage. I want them to enjoy marriage. Now, they're not going to have a perfect marriage, and you're not going to have a perfect marriage. Nobody's going to have a perfect marriage because you're putting two imperfect people together in an imperfect world who have imperfect expectations, who live in imperfect bodies, and uh, we're just imperfect. So we're not going to have a perfect marriage, but we can have a good marriage. And we can't have a Christ-centered marriage. And we can't have a marriage that brings glory to God. And so that's what I think that we should want, certainly, for one another. Certainly, if we have children, we should want that for our children, unless God's given them that gift of, of singleness. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Some people have that gift. And, and if you have that gift, you should embrace it and uh, use that for the glory of God. But as far as marriage is concerned, we do find in God's Word principles from God's Word that will help us to understand what God designed and intended marriage to be. You can't get any better information about marriage than the author of marriage and what he has to give to us, what he has to present to us. And he designed marriage and blessed marriage for the benefit of, of us as people and we find throughout Scripture that marriage brings two distinct and individual people together and makes them one. And God uses this one flesh relationship to picture the unity that is supposed to be between Christ and His church. When you trust Christ as your Savior, you are no longer separated from God, but you are brought to God. You've been reconciled to God. And, and the Bible talks about how that we are in Christ and how that Christ is in us and that picture of that reconciliation that happens between us and God and how marriage is a picture of those two individuals coming together and becoming one. And so as we look at our passage of Scripture today, Ephesians chapter 5, we'll begin reading in just a moment in verse number 21. Let me say this first of all, that this is not an exhaustive manual on the subject of marriage. Uh, there are a lot of other passages of Scripture that deal with marriage. And because we're trying to condense this all in one message, really I'm not doing this passage justice. I really should probably break this up into two or three messages, but I'm going to try to condense this all into one message. So there's a lot of things about marriage, a lot of things that we'll talk about today that we're just going to kind of skim the surface and, and really maybe the Lord will help us maybe later on and even maybe in that weekend to, to go over some of the... Uh, more uh, deeper things, if you will, of marriage. But this is not an exhaustive list, the verse, verses that we'll look at this morning. So please understand that. I'm going to reference some other scriptures. I want to encourage you to write those scriptures down and maybe take some time this week to read those and look those up, and that will give you a little bit better or bigger picture of what we'll be talking about this week or, or talking about today, and it'll give you a chance to kind of follow up on some of the things that we deal with. There's some things that we found already in Ephesians chapter 1, and I really believe that in the context of what we're talking about in the verses that we'll look at today, we really need to be reminded of the context of Ephesians chapter 5, because this is really a continuation of what Paul has said in the earlier verses when he talked about in verse 1 that we're to be imitators of God. Verse 2 talks about walking in love as Christ has loved us. 
And then he talks about what that looks like. What does it look like to walk in love? What does it look like to walk as Christ walked? And so he talks about those things. He gives us some practical applications, the things that we've been talking about over the last several weeks and the things that Pastor Darren talked about last week. What does all of that look like? <coughs> so we've been talking about how when we walk as Christ walked and we love as Christ loved, it leads to sacrifice. We were reminded of that in verse 2. We talked about how that walking in love avoids immorality and impurity and covetousness and inappropriate language. We looked at that in verses 3 through 7. And then in verses 8 and 9, we were reminded that if we walk in love, that we'll walk in the light and we'll walk as children of the light. Verses 8 and 9. And then verse 10 talks about uh, walking in a way that discerns what is pleasing to the Lord. In other words, as a Christian, I realize now that my life is no longer about me. It's about what pleases the Lord and how can I live my life to please the Lord. By the way, did you know that's where true fulfillment is found? You know, society says life is all about us, life is all about us, life is all about us, so people pursue things that are all about them. But you know what they find? They find unfulfillment. Because life was never intended to be all about us, it was intended to be all about Him. And when we live our lives for the glory of God, guess what we find as a fringe benefit of that? We find true fulfillment. Uh, Walking in love leads us to expose deceit and false teaching that harms other people. We found that in verses 11 through 14. It leads us to walking carefully and wisely, verses 15 through 17. It leads us, I think Pastor Darren dealt with this last week, uh, living those spirit-filled lives in verses 18 and 19. And then it results in a thankful heart, verse number 20. Now we see in this last section of chapter 5, that walking in love leads to mutual submission. Mutual submission. Now what does that look like? Well, it looks different for the, the wife than it does for the <coughs> husband. But husbands and wives have both been called to submission. Notice verse number 21, Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 21, where it says, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, he uses verse 21 as a conclusion of what he said already and also now as an introduction to what he is getting ready to say. And so he's, he's, he's concluding verses 1 through 20 by saying, Walking in love, in conclusion, leads to mutual submission. It leads to seeking what is best for the other person. And I'm willing to surrender what is best for me for them, and they are to be willing to surrender what is best for them for me. And in reality, when we do that, we find that we are uh, honoring the Lord and we find true fulfillment when we're willing to walk in that love and walk in that submissive spirit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so the first thing that we see in Paul's message regarding a practical marriage is that mutual submission is based upon our reverence for Christ. Mutual submission is based upon our reverence for Christ. The word submit here is an interesting word. It can mean several things. One of the things that it can mean is to place yourself under God's arrangement. To say, God, okay, this is the role that you have for my life. Uh, I, I believe as a, a, as a 16, 17-year-old man, as God, a young man, a, a kid really, as God was speaking in my heart and convicting my heart about His will for my life, and uh, he, he began to speak to my heart about His will for my life, there was a time in a missions conference where I came uh, to an altar at the end of a service, and I believe at that time I submitted, I, I fell under God's plan for my life. I said, I said yes to Him. I, I put up the white flag of surrender, if you will, and said, God, not my will, but yours be done. That is a picture of submission. It's placing yourself under God's arrangement. It has the idea of obeying, yielding, submitting, uh, has the idea uh, of, of, of saying uh, no to self and yes to God. And the, the idea of mutual submission is very foreign to a lot of people. Uh, they want to say that God's only called the wife to submit. That is not true. God has called both of us to submit. And we're going to look at that this morning. We're going to look at this idea, this picture of mutual submission. It's the idea of yielding ourselves one to another. 
Walking in love. This is what the whole chapter is talking about. Walking in love does not mean that we demand our own way. As a matter of fact, walking in love is just the opposite. If you think about the verse in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, it says this, Love does not insist on its own way. Love does not insist on its own way. Love yields to God's way and yields to <coughs> what is best for the person that I am demonstrating love to. That's what walking in love does. Christ gives us the ultimate example. These verses will be on your screen. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8. Think about this. It says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Let's, let's think about that. Do nothing from selfish ambition. Love does not insist on its own way. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but what? But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not look only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind in, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but what did He do? He emptied Himself, taking the form of a servant. By the way, we'll find out in just a moment, that's how we've been called to love our wives, just as Christ loved the church. Taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, what did He do? He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Christ sets the example for us. Our mutual submission to one another flows out of our reverence for Christ. Remember what he said in verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You say, Pastor Darrell, you just don't know my husband. You just don't know my wife. I don't. But God says that our mutual submission is not based on what they are, what they do, or what they don't do. Our mutual submission is based on our reverence that we have toward Christ. Toward Christ. Our spouse may fail us, but Christ never will. And we are to serve our spouse, and we are to be a man or woman of God that glorifies God as we minister to our spouse not because they're everything they're supposed to be, but because we are to bring glory to God in how we are to treat one another. It's not based on how worthy they are or how unworthy they are. It's not based on how we feel at the moment or whether they're being mutually submissive in return. It's based on our own reverence for Christ. Our respect of Christ and our respect of His Word is what our submissive attitude is is to be based upon. If it's based upon them and their performance, then it will be short-lived because you will find very quickly that they're human and they will fail you. But if our submission is based upon, by God's grace through faith, I'm going to choose to honor God by honoring them, then I can supernaturally, and by the way, listen, it is a supernatural thing by faith to honor someone who may not be honoring us in return. It takes God's supernatural strength if we're going to have that spirit. And so I said earlier, this mutual submission looks different for the wife than it does for the husband and for the husband than it does for the wife. This has nothing to do with equality. This has everything to do with God's role and God's divine order and Christ's example. <coughs> so let's look and see what it looks like. Biblical mutual submission for the husband and for the wife. And he deals with this aspect of wives first. Notice with me in verses 22 through 24. 
He says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. He reveals to us what the wife's submission looks like. We see who, first of all, or to whom the wife is to submit to. She is to, be, she is to submit to her own husband. She's not been called to submit to all men. Amen, ladies? Amen. You've not been called to submit to all men. You've not been called to submit to someone else's husband. You've not been called to submit to a boyfriend or to a fiancé. You've been called to submit to your own husband. And then God reveals, or excuse me, Paul reveals God's ordained order. He explains that Christ is the head of the church, not the pastor, not the deacons, not the elders, not the members. Christ is the head of the church. God has set up this authority structure within the church where Christ is the head. God has also set up an authority structure in the home where He has ordained the husband to be the head of the home under Christ. God has set this order. And usurping this authority structure is rebellion against God. And so... Again, and please understand, this has absolutely nothing to do with equality. This has to do with God's role, God's ordained role of the husband to be the spiritual leader of the home and the wife's uh, willing to submit to that leadership. Now, you may have heard in the news recently of a young lady by the name of Candace Cameron Bure. You, you probably remember her from Full House, those of you that are my age or, you know, you have kids that used to watch that show or whatever the case may be. And uh, there's a picture there of her when she was on Full House. It's a more recent picture. She has absolutely been vilified. She has been called unspeakable names that I will not repeat from this pulpit because she says that I have chosen to be in submission to my husband. I want to read to you a portion of what she said in her book, Balancing It All, by a story of juggling priorities and purpose. She writes these words. My husband is a natural-born leader. I am not a passive person, but I chose to fall into a more submissive role in our relationship because I want to do everything in my power to make my marriage and family work. The definition that I'm using, please understand, the definition that I'm using with the word submissive is the biblical definition. It is meekness, not weakness. It is strength under control. It is bridled strength. That's a good definition. She continued to say, I love that my man is a leader. I want him to lead and be the head of our family. Those major decisions do fall on him. It doesn't mean that I don't voice my opinion. It doesn't mean that I don't have an opinion. I absolutely do. By the way, do you know why God gave Adam Eve to begin with? Because he was incomplete. That's the reason he needed a woman, because God designed him incomplete. And any man who has one eye and half sense, as my pastor used to say when I was a kid, understands that he needs his wife's input. And if you think you don't, then what do you need to be married for to begin with? You need to seek her guidance and her wisdom and her input because she sees things that you don't see and she knows things that you don't know and she has an intuition that you don't have. That's why God gave her to you to begin with. That's a whole other message, but I'll uh, throw that in there for free. All right. She goes on to say, it doesn't mean, I said that, it doesn't mean I don't voice my opinion, it doesn't mean that I don't have an opinion, I absolutely do, but it's, different, it's very difficult to have two heads of authority. When you're competing with two heads, that can pose a lot of problems or issues. So within my marriage, we are equal in our importance, but we are just different in our performances. She went on to say, because I trust him and I build him up and give him respect that he would like to have within marriage, he so listens to everything I have to say and takes my opinion very seriously, and many times he will sway to what I would like, even if he doesn't see eye to eye with me because he really values my opinion. That is from her book, Balancing It All, My Story of Juggling Priorities and Purpose. Because of her, this decision to be public and, and to be open and honest, with how she believes she is honoring God's authority structure within her own marriage, she has been absolutely vilified in the media. And I want you to notice, notice a couple of things that she said that I think is really worth repeating. Number one, she says, I have chosen to fall into this role. 
Nowhere in Scripture is the husband told to make his wife or to tell his wife to submit. That is something that God has said to her. She is accountable for that decision, not you. Secondly, she realizes that two heads of authority causes problems and issues. That certainly is true. Thirdly, she says that God-given roles are not a matter of importance or equality, but a matter of different functions and performance. And so now as we go into this next section and look at what the husband's submission looks like, be reminded we're called to mutual submission. It looks different, yes, but submitting to one another is a way to reverence Christ, and when we choose to not do so, we are not rebelling against one another, but God Himself. And I would dare say, and maybe I say this, maybe I am a little prejudiced, that I think God calls men to surrender even more than He's called ladies to surrender. Let's see if you agree with me as we finish 25 through 30. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. That He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word. He's talking about how Christ did that for the church, verse 27, so that He may present the church to Himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy without blemish. In the same way, just as Christ has set this example for us, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, and he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. And we'll finish verse 31 in just a moment. So Christ has set this example of submission for the wife. We looked at that in the book of Philippians. We also see that example given to us in 1 Peter chapter 2. He also sets to us, gives to us the example of submission for the husband. Husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church, and notice, and gave himself up for her. That is submission. That, that a husband, a man, has been called to love his wife so much to that degree that Christ loved the church that he's willing to lay down his life for her. And listen, you know, any macho guy can say, hey, you know, if somebody breaks in my house, I'm going to stand between the robber and, you know, I'm going to take the bullet, blah, blah. Listen, you may have to do that one day, and you ought to be willing to do that. But listen, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about laying down your life for her in every way. In every aspect, in every uh, uh, in every uh, design, if you will. Notice, notice, first of all, Christ, the Bible says, sacrifice for the church. You cannot love your wife biblically. You cannot love your wife as Christ loved the church. You cannot demonstrate mutual submission to your wife if you are unwilling to sacrifice for her. You've been called to lay down your life for her physical and spiritual well-being. What is sacrifice? Sacrifice involves surrendering something that is precious for the benefit of someone else. So, oh, I'm willing to take the bullet. Yeah, but are you willing to spend time with her? Because 99% of the time, you're not going to have to take a bullet for her. I'm glad you're willing to do that. God forbid it may come to that one day. But are you willing to sacrifice your time for her? Are you willing to sacrifice your desires for her? Are you willing to sacrifice whatever for her physical, spiritual, mental, emotional well-being? That's what the Christ-like love looks like when a husband demonstrates that. We can't love our wives as Christ loved the church if we're not sacrificing. Secondly, and along with this picture of sacrifice, is giving. The Bible says that he gave himself up for the church. See, see guys have this idea. I, I shouldn't say this. Many guys have this idea. Now, all they want to talk about is submission. That's all they want to talk about. Bible says submit, Bible says submit, Bible says submit. For every one time, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is accurate, for every one time 
God says for the wife to submit, God tells the husband two or three times to love his wife as Christ loved the church. I asked my wife one day, I said, why do you think God says to wives once submit and says to men three times to love their husbands? She said, because you always have to tell a man everything more than once. <laughs> he gave himself up for the church's benefit. Why did he do that? He gave himself up so the church could be sanctified, set apart for God, so the church could be cleansed, washed in the precious blood of Christ, so the church could be presented uh, to the Father in splendor, he says, without spot or wrinkle. So a husband has not been called to treat his wife like a doormat, like a maid, like a child, like an employee. He has been called to give himself up for his wife. I wrote this in my notes and I've got it in bold print because it speaks to me and convicts me. Everything that I do as a husband should be to benefit my wife physically, mentally, socially, spiritually. That means I have to set aside my own selfish desires and give myself up for her. That's what mutual submission and loving my wife as Christ loved the church looks like. He goes on to use another illustration. He said, give her the same treatment, the same care, the same concern that God expects you to give your own body. Now, when I wrote this out, I was going to leave out part of that sentence. I was going to say, you should treat her like you treat your own body. But there's a lot of people that don't treat their body very good. So I reworded it and I said it this way. Give her the same treatment, care, and concern that God expects you to give your own body. The Bible tells us as Christians that our bodies are what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. And if my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, I ought to take care of the temple of the Holy Spirit. I ought not to abuse it. I ought not to dishonor it. Ought, and therefore, if God expects me to take care of my physical body that way, he also expects me as a husband to take care of my wife that way. I should care for her. I should love her. I should be concerned about her. I should give her the same treatment that God expects me to give my own body. Logically speaking, uh, we, wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't hate our flesh, but we should nourish our flesh. We should cherish our flesh just like Christ does the church. He nourishes the church. He cherishes the church. It is something precious to him. It is something that he gave his life for. It is something that he shed his blood for. It is top priority. The church is top priority. Your wife should be top priority. Paul indicates that the logical response to nourish and cherish our body just like Christ nourishes and cherishes the church. And when you take care of her, you are taking care of yourself. There's some practical ways the Bible gives us, and again, this is not an exhaustive list, but I think these will be on your screen. It's going to be kind of small, maybe hard for you to see, but these are the scriptures I want to encourage you to look up this week. So Isaiah will leave that up for a couple of minutes so you can uh, write those down if you'd like. Number one, you need to be considerate, considerate of her and treat her with respect. Uh, First Peter talks about dwelling with her according to knowledge. You need to know her. You need to get to know her. And men, that's a lifelong process. Can I get an amen? <laughs> it's a, and I'm not trying to be critical, but it, we're, we're wired different. We're made different. We think different. We look at things different. You know? And we need to learn her. We need to be considerate of her. We need to dwell with her according to knowledge. Colossians 3.19 talks about not being harsh toward her. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 reminds us that our body does not belong to ourselves. It belongs to her. We should use... Uh, use our bodies to meet her needs rather than being selfish. Proverbs 5, verses 18 through 20 talks about rejoicing with the wife of your youth. Be captivated with her. Be captivated with her alone. Proverbs 31 talks about praising the virtuous woman. How her, her children, her husband, rise up and call her blessed. Uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 4 and chapter 7 uh, the, the, the bridegroom there is complimenting his wife and complimenting her body. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13 talks about keeping your marriage undefiled and keeping your marriage pure in every way. Those are just a few ways that you can show your wife that love, that consideration, 
that mutual submission, that sacrifice. Now, uh, let me just pause and throw in something else for just a moment before we finish up uh, this chapter. We all know that this would be the ideal marriage. Mutual submission is taking place, but we also all know that there's a lot of people that are not in an ideal marriage. We all understand that. We all understand that sin has messed people up, stuff from their past they bring into their marriage. Um, sometimes uh, people get married and then one of those individuals becomes a Christ follower and their other one doesn't. And you have all of that you know, stuff to deal with. I understand. But just remember, let me just encourage you with this. You do what God's called you to do. And you pray for that person. And you pray that God would open that person's heart, open that person's eyes. And you pillow your head at night knowing that God, I honored you today. First Peter also talks about, I wish we had time to deal with that today, but First Peter also talks about how, how you know, if a, if a woman's married to a husband that's not a believer, how that, that her lifestyle and her example, uh, not, not with words, not, 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 you know, badgering him, not, not preaching to him, but just that lifestyle of, 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 of this, what we're talking about today, that lifestyle of, of, of Christ-like love, that lifestyle of mutual submission, that God can use those actions to speak much louder than words to that man's heart. And so he concludes this chapter with some practical application in closing verses 31 through 33. He says, therefore, everything I just said, I'm now, I'm now concluding, and he says, therefore, if you're going to love your wife, like God's just called you to love your wife sacrificially, unselfishly, uh, purposefully, all those things. He says, you have to leave your father and mother. You have to cut the apron springs. When, when I, my wife and I first got married, uh, we moved about two hours away from our parents. That's one of the best things I think we could have ever do. Because we had to learn, we had to learn to depend on one another. She couldn't just walk next door every time we had a fight. I couldn't walk next door every time we had a fight. We had to learn to work things out. We had to learn to depend on one another. We had to learn to grow together. We had to learn to, 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 to help one another. We had to learn. And I want to tell you, that's a, that, that, that can be a big detriment if those apron strings aren't cut. And that doesn't mean that you don't love your mom and dad. And that doesn't mean you don't still have a relationship with your mom and dad. And that doesn't mean that you're, you know, you're not around your mom and dad. But it does mean that there is a new relationship that is now taking priority. And if you're not willing to let that new relationship take priority, then maybe you need to wait. Because he says, if you're going to love your wife like you need to, you're going to have to leave your father and mother. And you're going to have to hold Fast. The King James says, cleave. You're going to have to hold fast to your wife. Not those apron strings anymore. And the two shall become one flesh. So this is a mystery. It's profound. I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. You see what I'm saying? God has to pound that through our thick skulls, guys. We, you know, I'm the first to admit God has to say stuff to us more than once. Over and over again, love your wife, love your wife, love your wife. Love her as Christ loved the church. Don't love her like uh, maybe you were taught to love her. You love her as Christ loved the church. Don't love her in maybe the bad example that you saw growing up. You love her as Christ loved the church. Over and over again, he says that to us. Love her, love her, love her sacrificially. Love her as Christ loved the church. And then he concludes, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And that's really what submission is all about, is that respect factor. So when that woman and that man come together before God, they are declared one flesh, 
Just as God has reconciled Jew and Gentile through Christ and brought them into one body, He brings these two unique individuals and makes them one. It's no longer His and hers, but it's ours. And Paul says in conclusions, Guys, you got to love your wife just as you love yourself. Wives, respect your husband. Respect him in that God-given leadership role, and you're ultimately respecting God. You love her as Christ loved the church, and you're ultimately respecting God. And as you love one another, and as you respect one another, and as you sacrifice one another, you can find that your marriage can be the closest thing to heaven on earth. But I want to tell you, it can also be the closest thing to hell on earth if we're not doing it God's way. And I don't, I'm not trying to mean that disrespectfully. I'm just saying, if we don't do marriage God's way, it can be the furthest thing from heaven on earth. Marriage is what you will allow God to make it. And it begins with submission. You say, where does that submission begin? It begins with submitting to God. See, it's not about, well, she's not doing what God told her to do. Or he's not doing what God told him to do. No, it's about me submitting to God. Remember, it's out of reverence for Christ. I'm submitting to God. And in submitting to God, that's going to overflow in my marriage. But if I... If my basis for submission is based on what he does or she does or he says or she says, then that is going to be very short-lived. But if my submission is based on my respect for God, then we can keep on keeping on for his glory and through his supernatural strength and help in that alone. Because sometimes it gets very difficult and it can be very hard. Maybe you find yourself in that type of marriage where you're trying to submit to the Lord in these areas, but you have a spouse that could care less. Remember, one day you're going to stand before God and not Him or her. You're going to have to keep doing what's right and let Christ live that life of love and respect through you. You say, Pastor, I'm not married yet. Or maybe one day I want to be and you know, God's got a lot to say about this stuff. I encourage you. When you get to that point where you're ready to get married, and, and I want to encourage you to come back tonight. We're talking about dating tonight in our, in our, um, our family-driven faith study. Modern American dating, I believe, is setting kids up for divorce. I really believe it. People that have no interest in getting married and have no interest in planning to get married or not ready to get married are, are, are involved in isolated relationships until the feeling wears off and then they get involved in another isolated relationship until that feeling wears off and they get involved in another isolated relationship until that feeling wears off. And guess what happens when you get married and the feeling wears off? I'm afraid we're setting our kids up for divorce. Now, there's nothing wrong with dating. I believe if it's done the right way, we'll talk about that tonight, so come back and find out what that's all about. But when you start, when you're ready to get married and you're starting to look for Mr. Right or Mrs. Right, you need to ask yourself some questions. Number one, does this person love God? They cannot love me the way they need to love me if they don't love God. Because what we're talking about this morning is supernatural. This does not come natural. It doesn't come natural to me or you or anybody else. So they can't love me the way God tells them to love me if they don't have God's help. And if they don't love God and they're not serving God and they don't know God and they don't know Christ as their Lord and Savior, then ultimately they may be good in a lot of ways, but they can't love me to the degree that Christ loves the church without God's supernatural help. That's why the Bible tells us in our relationship that we are not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It was told us when I was a teenager, choose a date fit for a mate. If he or she is not the kind of person you want to marry, then don't get in a relationship with them. You wait till you find the person 
and you get to know them in a group setting, you get to know them, and you find out their relationship with God, and their relationship with God is what it ought to be, then they can be the kind of wife or the husband that you need one day. Watch them. Do they have Christ-like qualities like sacrifice, humility, concern for your physical and spiritual well-being, concern for your sexual purity, the other things that we've discussed. If they don't have these traits now, then don't think that marriage is going to be the fix-all. It's not. If they're not treating you the way they ought to treat you now, it, more than likely they're going to treat you worse when you get married, not better. So you need to really think this through. If they're neglecting areas now, they're probably going to neglect it more when you get married. Don't think you can change them. You cannot change a person. That is something that only God can do. Now, He may use you as an instrument and a vessel, but God's the only one that can bring change. If you find yourself in a difficult, difficult marriage, focus on the positives and seek every day by God's grace to be what God wants you to be and do what God wants you to do. He can give you the grace to help your marriage not just survive, but thrive. Even if you have an uncooperative spouse, make sure that your ultimate fulfillment does not come from them. Your ultimate fulfillment must come from God and His Word. Keep your eyes on Christ and live the life that He wants you to live. I don't know where you're at in all this today. Maybe you feel like, hey, this doesn't apply to me. and You know, I, I don't know. I don't know where you're at. But I know this is God's Word. And I know we've been called to preach God's Word. So if you are married today, let me encourage you to choose to be the biblical husband or wife that God's called you to be. I didn't tell you it's going to be easy. God doesn't say it's going to be easy. You know, think about how God loves us. I've been very unlovely at times, but God still loves me. We've got to love one another. We've got to treat one another with respect. We've got to treat one another the way that we want to be treated. We've got to love, for one, we've got to love one another. We've got to sacrifice. We've got to understand it's not about me. It's about, it's about Him. It's about what's best for them. For the glory of God, of course. And I don't know about you, but when I read passages like this as a man and read passages like this as a husband and as a dad, thinking about my own boys one day, I realize there's a whole lot of work that God still needs to do in my heart to help me be all that I need to be for my family. I need His help. I need His strength. And I, I don't embarrass, I'm not embarrassed to tell you that I, I, I need that. And I pray for it often. Um, and I think in services like this, it's great if husbands and wives can just pray with one another and say, God, you know, our marriage is an example to this next generation. Our marriage is an example to my children. My sons are going to learn how to be a husband by watching me. My, my daughter is going to learn to be a wife by watching me. Would, ask yourself this, guys. Would you want your daughter marrying a man just like you? Would you want your son, ladies, marrying a wife? then why do you need to let God change? Why do you need to let God change? i got one finger pointing at you, but i got three pointing back at me today. <laughs> remember that. I'm preaching to myself as much as anybody else, and I preach this because I love you. I want every marriage and every potential marriage in this room to be everything that it can be for the glory of God. Would you bow your heads with me?